All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live session for, what's today? Thursday, June 10th, 2021. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching right now from all parts of the internet, whether you're on Facebook, you're on LinkedIn, you're on YouTube, or you're on Twitch, welcome. As you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. And if you are listening to us sometime in the future, which is kind of bizarre to think about, if you're listening to the podcast version of Context and Clarity Live, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. We've got a great show lined up for you today, an exciting guest and a really important topic, as all of our topics are, of course. But uh, we're going to kick that off here in just a second. But we want to make sure that everybody is strapped in, ready to go, and um, get your listening ears on, and also ready to ask your questions and make comments today. Uh, as you know, we try to make these conversations as interactive and engaging as we can. So if you have a question that comes up during this conversation, go ahead and post it wherever you are. Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, it doesn't matter. It still pops up on our screen and we'll see that question. We'll see if we can get that question into the conversation today. If you're on Facebook right now, like I see Rod is and Scott is. Hi guys. Uh, Brian's over there on LinkedIn and Kurt, of course, is on Twitch. Glad to have you over there, Kurt, hurting, the, uh, hurting all the cats over on Twitch. All the Entree Architect cats. I didn't know we had Entree Architect cats until just now, but uh, <laughs> welcome <laughs> welcome from, from Twitch. If you're on Facebook and you're making a comment and your name pops up as Facebook user, we won't abbreviate that. We tried that earlier. It doesn't work real well. Uh, if you pop up as Facebook user instead of your own name, that is because Facebook has privacy settings. You're in the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. It is a private group for uh, for architects only, and Facebook is not allowed to release your information unless you give them permission to speak to Restream, which is where we are right now. So in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen right now is a URL. It's chat.restream.io slash FB, as in Facebook. If um, if you would like to give Facebook permission to publish your name when you comment, go to that URL, chat.restream.io slash FB, and uh, you can connect Facebook and Restream, and we will see your name just like I see Ryan Shoup, who's joining us from central New Jersey right now, um, which apparently doesn't exist. I don't, I don't get that joke. I'm not in New Jersey, uh, but apparently that's the thing, so... <laughs> Anyway, you can uh, you can do that. We can see your name, or you can just continue to be a Facebook user, one of many. I don't know about a billion by now, and uh, but we'll see your comment either way. It's just, do you want to hide behind Facebook or do you want to be a real person? I don't know. <laughs> Catherine, <laughs> what have I? Question. That's a big question. Hey, so we seem to be having the same problem on Facebook that we were having yesterday with the um, comments not loading. Oh, okay. Well, so, so um, one of the things that happened yesterday, and I, I, I believe this is a Facebook thing. Uh, it looks like uh, the refresh on Facebook may be broken. So if you're on Facebook right now and comments aren't streaming in, I think you're going to have to keep hitting uh, refresh in order to see that. I believe your video will keep streaming as long as you hit play. But, um, but yesterday we were having to hit refresh in order to get more and more comments. I don't know what's up with that. Uh, probably some sort of update that didn't go as well as somebody might have thought. So uh, that might be an issue, but it looks like Barry jumped over to LinkedIn. So glad to have you there, Barry. If you if you would rather check out LinkedIn or YouTube or Twitch, uh, it's easy. You still you see the same thing. You can still comment. You can still watch. You can still listen. It's just from a different platform. If you want to go to LinkedIn, just go over to LinkedIn. Find me. Pretty easy to find. Jeff Eccles. Um, find my, uh, find my profile and you can watch it live there or go to the Entree Architect YouTube channel. Mark's over there on YouTube. Hi, Mark. And, uh, or you could join, um, join our massive crowd <laughs> and Kurt who is uh, herding cats on Twitch. Go over to Twitch. Check that out. If you've never, uh, never done that, by the way, if, if I had to be honest about it, 
Twitch is actually the best platform for this. It's built specifically for streaming hmm. and it works really, really well. Um, but, you know. Do you have to join maybe, Twitch? I'm not even sure what Twitch is. Ask, ask your kids that are gamers. They'll tell you what Twitch is. Well, that's why I thought it was a Switch for all this time. <laughs> a Switch? Well, isn't that the little handheld thing that they use? Oh, that's well. I thought we were streaming on Switch for a long time because of that. <laughs> nope, that's weird. Nope, we're twitching. We're twitching. It's okay. like this. I'll have to look that up. Yep. Uh, Mark says Twitch has the most reliable stream for sure. All right. So uh, Kurt says go to twitch.tv, check it out. Uh, look for Entree Architect twitch.tv if you want to do that. But you can. All that being said, you can watch from anywhere: Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitch. And uh, if you need to, you need to know, uh, just ask the question here on the screen, and we'll get you there somehow. Not a problem. Um, okay, what did we forget, Catherine? I'm sure I left something out. Oh no, I think you covered it. I mean, we do have a guest today. We do have a guest. We're going to get to that momentarily. Yeah. Lots of we got some new names coming in today. That's great. Uh, glad to have all of you here. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you're not familiar, context and clarity is this live simulcast that we do every Thursday afternoon uh, on, on all those channels that we just talked about. Context and Clarity is also a conversation that's a live stream every weekday afternoon inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group, 4 p.m. Eastern for all of those shows. We are also on uh, the Clubhouse app for a 30-minute coffee talk every weekday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, and Context and Clarity is also a short form, just a few minutes long, uh, podcast that comes out every morning and and just you know in terms of format that podcast is really a review of what we talked about yesterday on context and clarity and a preview of what we'll talk about today on context and clarity so it's it's a nice way to kind of close the loop on all of these conversations so you can you can find context and clarity in a lot of ways obviously you found context and clarity live today and context and clarity live is where Catherine and I co-host this and we have a special guest, which probably means that I ought to introduce that guest and bring them into the conversation today because that's that's really kind of why we're here. So with that, our guest today is a coach and an expert in marketing and business development. She's a motivator, a strategist, and an unstoppable force for human empowerment. She's the director of coaching at Win Without Pitching, Shannon Lee, there you are. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> so glad, great to uh, be here. <laughs> glad you could join us today. Sorry we left you in the green room for so long. Um, hopefully, hopefully the cats didn't find you in there. <laughs> no, I was just having my uh, stout float that we were talking about <laughs> before you put me in the green room, so I'm ready to go. <laughs> nice. You see, th this, yeah. is, this is the benefit of being a guest on Context and Clarity. You can request whatever it is that you want to have in the green room and Shannon requested a stout float. And so we uh, got for her a, a, a stout called Architects Breakfast from Black Acre Brewing in Indianapolis, put a little bit of vanilla ice cream on top of that. And now she is ready, ben and Jerry's. ready to go. Vanilla ice cream from Ben yeah. and Jerry's. Yeah, not just any vanilla ice cream. Exactly. <laughs> and, Teleported and it right out. over. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Exactly. And a shout out to Black Acre and uh, Ben and Jerry's both. If you if you have been looking for a show to sponsor, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well how's, done. <laughs> yeah, how's how's that for shameless plug right there? <laughs> ben, Jerry, we hear you. <laughs> Guys and gals at uh, Black Acre, we're here for you. <laughs> Happy to celebrate your products. In in the green room and not. <laughs> Well, uh, again, Shannon, thank you for being here. Um, one, one of, one of my favorite things to do is to suggest to every architect out there to read the book, Win Without Pitching Manifesto. Um, I actually require some of my clients read it before we start working together, uh, because I, I think what's in there, uh, represents a mindset shift for a lot of architects. Uh, in the way that they think about and they they do business and, and obviously the way that they pursue work. Uh, one of the things that I would say right now that we hear a lot, especially in the world of small firms, which is the majority of our audience right now, um, many small firms, not all, but many small firms are really busy right now. That doesn't mean 
that they have the projects that they want to be working on. It just means that they have projects and a lot of projects and they're bit and they're busy right now. So all that being said, what, what, the, what should they really be doing right now from a marketing, a business development, a sales point of view, even, even though they're busy, what should they be doing right now? Well, thank you for spreading the good word about the manifesto. First of all, um, it means a lot and hopefully it's of value. I think it is. I hear from a lot of architects, interior designers in your space that it's a helpful philosophy. And then it's about how do we really embrace this? And so I think the first thing I would encourage everybody to do is give yourself the gift of some time to work on your business, because I think that often gets very missed and lost. And the first exercise I would have everybody do is take a hard look at your positioning. And, you know, we come back to it in most all cases, but it really does matter that you're seen as meaningfully different. And it really does take time and sacrifice to get there. And so it's an exercise in fundamental business strategy. And it's a really valuable exercise because it sets you up then to launch a proper marketing effort, to feel like you have control in sales conversations and to have a lot more confidence in how you show up when you're about ready to talk to a potential client. Yeah, that, that's great advice. And I, I think, you, you know, one of the things that that you talk about a lot and, and that's in, in the book uh, is this idea of expertise. Um, so so maybe, maybe a place to start is wh- what's an expert? What is an expert yeah. when it comes to the space? So in my mind, it starts with your focus, which is defined by your market and discipline. And we know your discipline is architecture or interior design or a peripheral, but then it becomes more about who is it that you're helping and what is the value that you're bringing. And when you have an area of expertise, like maybe designing for craft distilleries or breweries, like we were talking about earlier, Jeff, you are somebody who can come in and really deeply understand your clients' pain points and challenges and what the future may look like for them based on your understanding of their industry, for example. And you can help them mitigate risk. You can help them vision. You can bring hints and tips and tricks for things they need to consider. So you have deep knowledge and deep insight. And you see patterns and problems across whatever market um, or audience that you're choosing to specialize in. And that brings a lot of reassurance and that brings a lot of value that you can unlock in the work that you're doing. Yeah. I love that. I think that's great advice. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. I'm, I'm actually um, going to be doing a, a speaking engagement this evening for a group of architects in New Jersey. And it's the title is uh, from service provider to trusted advisor. And, you know, as you were saying that, I thought, well, why don't I just bring Shannon on with me and she could just explain this whole thing. <laughs> it's going <laughs> to be a very similar <laughs> conversation. Um, yeah. I, I love that idea. You know, you, you dug into basically an understanding that's, that's beyond design. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. really important, um, really important for architects to, to understand if they want to be that expert. I, I like to call them trusted advisors as well. Mm-hmm. It's that, right? It's a practitioner. It's You're no longer a vendor or an order taker. You're a practitioner. You're an expert advisor. And there are many benefits to specialization. The first one is it's just it's foundational for you and for your team. You understand why you're showing up each day and what your mission is that you won't sacrifice in terms of the kind of work you want to do. And it makes the the exercise of targeting and marketing much easier because you have this platform and and lens that you're looking through and you know who your target clients are and you know how to go start a conversation with them. And all of this helps to lower your cost of sale because you get much better at more quickly qualifying and deciding who you should say no to and who you should say yes to and take a next step with. And the one thing that I love the most is this idea of improving your personal balance sheet through specialization, your confidence and your belief that you deserve to be at that table. The, the um, one of the, 
how do I want to say it? What, one of the uh, one of the things I think is required for everything that you just said, and, and, and everything that's in the Win Without Pitching Manifesto, for that that matter, is a real discipline. Right? It's it's not oh this is what we're going to do today. Oh it's it's you know it it takes a discipline to stick to these things that you've talked about, you know, you're going to draw a line in the sand somewhere. You're going to do these things. You have to be able to stick to that. How, how do we, how do we develop that discipline to be able to, to accomplish these things that you talk about? I think that the first step is being able to engage in a, in a meaningful and thoughtful exercise to make decisions around where you want to specialize because there is art and science to it. And there is no, sure thing. I mean, you have to do the work to really understand where you've won business in the past, where your passion lies, where you have the most knowledge, um, where you see the future going and where you may want to grow into and really have somebody help you through that exercise and have a guided framework to go through that exercise because it is an exercise in sacrifice and it can be really scary and you can feel like you're walking away from a lot of opportunities. So. The first thing is professional on your side to help you through. The second thing is bring that attitude of experimentation and be open to trying new things and bring your bravery. And then from there, once you make decisions and you go tell the world about this new area of specialization, you need some wins to continue to prove it to yourself, to continue to maintain that discipline. So it's also about setting expectations that this is a journey and it's not going to happen overnight. <clears throat> but when you have those wins, when you start to trust and believe, it it makes it all a lot easier, I would say. So there's there's a few things that need to line up there in order for it to happen. You mentioned meaningful conversations, and it reminded me that uh, I, was, I was in a conversation, uh, oh, maybe a month or so ago, and someone someone asked, um, you, you know how. How do I figure out what's next? How do I f- how do I figure out how to do this? And and somebody else at the table said, "Go talk to ten people." So in yeah. in this context, maybe it's go talk to ten of your ideal clients, have these mm-hmm. meaningful conversations with them. And and they said, "I guarantee that if you have this conversation with ten different clients, you're going to know exactly what the next step is." You know, you're going to, you're yeah. going to learn, learn mm-hmm. enough. You're going to, that reconnaissance is going to, uh, is going to tell you what the next step that you need to do is or next step you need to take. Yeah. I love that. I think you're right. I think it's have go have those conversations with people that you trust or people that you don't know, but you want to learn more about. And then also think about the 10 things that you don't know that you should know if you're going to be an expert in this space and create a learning path for yourself to go go get the knowledge, go get the education, um, or, or jump and maybe do something pro bono, right? Try something different that really allows you to get uncomfortable and really learn in a hands-on way, because there's, there's no better way to do it than that sometimes. I'd like to talk in extremes sometimes, give extreme examples sometimes. It's, you know, Mm -hmm. creates that contrast that we need. And so a lot of times I'll talk about your ideal client or a ideal mm-hmm. client and most architects will go, well, I can't have an ideal client because I do, uh, I do restaurants and I do hotels and I do, you know, senior facilities or whatever. So how do, how do we balance this idea of deep knowledge and expertise with the reality that many of the firms, uh, even small firms, even some sole practitioners have several different service areas, several different project types. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that? I think it becomes this act in discipline where it's very reasonable to think you will take work on outside of an area of specialization, for example. And maybe you have some experience in healthcare, although you're working more in, you know, hotel redesign right now but a healthcare client comes to you and you through your discipline and through a litmus test of saying, okay, yes, I can help you because I have the capabilities. I don't have to go learn something new. That's the first check mark in the box. Yes, I can help you because I have capacity 
I don't have to hire somebody to do this job. That's the second thing you check. And yes, I can help you because it will be profitable to me is the third box. And yes, I can help you because I don't have to compete for this. I don't have to get in a procurement process or a big you know, dog and pony show pitch. So if you can have those four things be true and just keep some discipline around that, then you should take the work. You don't have to say no. It's not about saying no if they're not right in your sweet spot. It's about being in control in the sale and having some things that are non-negotiable for you if you're going to move forward with the work. Yeah. I I like that point. And a lot of a lot of the base message of win without pitching is that control, that control of sale. Mm-hmm. Um, so how so maybe what's the first step for if if I'm an architect that has never Maybe I don't really even think about sales that much. I, I haven't taken any sales training. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, I have to sell because I have a business, right? So I, I have to bring work in, but I, ha- I have have no practice in it, no guidance in it, no training in it. What's the first step mm-hmm. to understanding how to take control of that process? I think it's understanding what motivates you to go sideways in the sale. And what I mean by that is, are you somebody that is really competitive and you're just going to do whatever you can to win? And so you then go do that, you lower price or you do something that's really, you know, cutthroat just to win the business. Or are you somebody that has a high affiliation need, which means you really have this need to be liked and that motivates you in the sale to be too friendly and uh, serve that, that prospect to be too much before you even like get into actually winning the work or are you somebody that has to be in control so you dominate and you're difficult um really get in touch with what motivates you in the sale to have challenges and understand that examine that name that and then throw it out the door and recognize yep i do have some kind of baggage i might bring to the sale but for the sake of the conversation today i'm just going to let that go And I'm just first and foremost going to have a conversation to see if I can help. I don't need to sell something in this first conversation. Let's just first see if I can help. And then we'll decide if we take a next step together. What's the danger of not being in control of the sale? Oh, well, then you get treated like that vendor. And it's a dismal place to exist because that client to be is imposing their will and their process and their pricing demands on you and they're they're in charge and in the end they're not going to get a good product and you're not going to deliver good value and nobody's happy uh, so it just i just don't want you to even have to go there if you don't have to yeah it's I think uh, I think that's a place that most architects would like to avoid but but yeah. I also think that's a reality for a mm-hmm. lot of architects, I see on the screen right now that uh, there are a couple of comments about, you know, comparing architects and doctors and and lawyers, and that that's a that's a pretty common complaint, right? In in yeah. the world of architecture, oh, you know, we're professionals, doctors and lawyers are professionals, but they're paid drastically differently, and 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 they're respected drastically differently than than architects are. What? Do you have a feeling for why that is? Well, I think because you're not trusting your gut and speaking up in moments when you know something doesn't feel right. Um, And what I mean by that is, why not use that language in a sales conversation if you feel like somebody is treating you less than or viewing you as a vendor? Why not in that moment say, hey, I don't know if it feels this way to you, but it sure feels to me like, Maybe you're not quite seeing the value I can bring, or maybe you're not seeing why the way we work is equivalent, frankly, to the way a doctor or a lawyer would work. If we don't do our job, that's malpractice. If we don't diagnose and understand the problem and design to a specification that is not only safe, but can live long into the future and fill your needs, well, then we're on the hook just as much as if a doctor or a lawyer didn't do their job. So, you know, like, why not just call it what it is in a conversation if, in fact, that is happening to you and find a way to be kind in your words, right, but ruthless in your behavior of speaking up when it doesn't feel right. 
I love that. And I, I wonder how many in our audience have ever, ever considered or, or tried doing anything like that because it's, uh, as, as you were saying, and I thought, you know, that's, that's sort of revolutionary, right? I'm actually going to stand up for myself and, <laughs> yeah. and say that. Yeah, that's, that's taking saying no to the next level, Jeff. I mean, yeah, it is. It's kind of, yeah, just it makes total sense. But I don't know that I could ever say that. I'll have to practice that. At home. I think, Catherine, you bring up a good point. And I think why people don't take the action often is because they don't know the right words to use. And so, Modeling language is a lot of what we do with our clients to show them, here's how you might say it. Now, let's practice. Like, how might you get those words out of your mouth in a way that feels good for you? And I think once you can find the language, then it helps, you know, to muster the courage a little further and like, speak the truth. Yeah. yeah. I like that idea of practice because it's, it, many of these things I, I equate to, you know, sometimes we call them the, our, the muscle, right? We, we've got to develop yeah. the the muscle through practice mm -hmm. in the same way you would if you were a, uh, a runner or a basketball player or, you know, whatever, whatever your sport is, you've got to develop these things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it feels really yeah. The idea of saying that seems like I would, I, I can't imagine saying it. So I'm sure the first few times I say it, it feels ridiculous. And then as I say it more, it'll feel like, of course, you know, so that's why we do have to practice. Here's a, here's a great, um, the podcast episode that, that Blair and, and David Baker did on the Two Bobs podcast that they host. It's The podcast is called You Contain Multitudes. And it's really something we've been digging into more lately where it, take the moment to understand what persona you can walk into when fear sets in. And mm -hmm. we have a client who takes, she's a, a very like petite, lovely woman from the Midwest. And she's like, I'm always so Midwest nice, but man, when I know I need to like stand up for myself, she becomes the baseball player, Chuck Finley. And she just <laughs> brings the badass to the situation awesome. and it works for her. And so we all have these multitudes in us. We all have different roles we play throughout the day. So we're not just one person. We can do more than we think. So who is your persona that you take on to bring that, that badass, right? Hmm. I love, I that. love that. Who is your yeah. persona that you take on when you're, when you need to be a badass? What do you turn, like, what is you, who do you turn into? Well, most recently it, it's uh, the prime minister of New Zealand, Jacinda. Like <laughs> know, she's just, good one. no problem. But before that it was 007. Like, cause I always love the idea of being a spy. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one too. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. So, so maybe now everybody needs to put into the comments uh, who yes. your who your alter ego uh, needs to be, right? When 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 you have to step out of your normal personality and put on that badass uh, that badass brand that badass persona, who is it? Put that in the comments right now. We want to know who your uh, hmm. who your uh, persona is. I love that. It's a great, uh, it's a great analogy, great tool. And, and I think a lot of this, we've talked about this before, you know, whether it's for, uh, uh, speaking, you know, I, I used to do a lot of speaking from stages. Stages are going to come back soon. Um, yeah. as an, as an introvert or an ambivert, I have to play some real mental games, right. To get myself into that place uh, where it's not about 500 or a thousand or four people or however many people are in the room. It's yeah. about, for me, it's about one person that's in the room that needs to hear what I, I have to say today. Um, I think there are a lot of situations where we, we have to play these mental games. Uh, so I, I really, uh, I really appreciate the, the idea of, of that persona. Um, yeah, I think. go ahead. I was just going to say it's, um, this idea of speaking from the stage is another spin on it and you have to find your way into how you sell in a similar vein. And I think from, for many of you in the business you're in coaching, the conversion in the sale is helpful. And what I mean by that is be the educator, be the wise sage guide that serves to reassure and can do a good job of explaining, hey, 
these are big projects that I know you're about to make an investment in, whether it's a home or commercial or architectural project, right? Like it can be scary because you don't know how it goes. And it may mean like your home is turned upside down or your building's not ready, but the, you know, the team is there to start work. So you really become that wise, sage, reassuring guide, take on that kind of role in the sale as an educator, for example. So I think that's, that's another spin on it. If it doesn't have to be a persona, it can be how you show up in terms of what your role is in the sale. You can be a coach in the sale. Uh, it, you said a minute ago, explain. Uh, yeah. So how does, um, how does an architect explain what their client gets when they hire them? Yeah. In plain English. <laughs> and what I mean by that, and this is because I've worked with so many architects and interior designers, and I have a, I have a recent example where I have a, a good friend who's helping me with an interior design project in my office, and she said, I'm going to send you some memos to choose from, and I get these in the mail, okay? Can, I don't know if you can all see it. This is a fabric swatch in my mind. This is not a memo. A yeah, memo is a piece of not paper, a memo. right? Or, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm thinking, well, where, what's, when, when does the memo come? And I see this all the time when I'm working with clients in your market. Think about the jargon and the language and think about, do, do, do the prospects I'm talking to even know what all of that means? Do they know what a journeyman is? Do they know what schematics are? Right? You got to take a hard look at all of your language and figure out a way to translate it to what feels approachable and accessible and understandable. So I think that's the first place to start. The, d have you ever run across uh, Kathy Clote's guest? Do you know that name? I know the name, but I'm not totally familiar, no. So she's, she's a friend of mine. She's out in the Silicon Valley. Um, yeah. She does things like very similar to what I do, except for the IT, the, t the tech people, the tech companies mm -hmm. out in uh, Silicon Valley. Um, and she's also, uh, she's also been an improv comedian for, um, 30 years or something like that. And she coined this phrase that I think she, you know, she coined it for her people in the tech world, but it's so applicable and it's, it's exactly what you just said, but she, she calls it jargon monoxide poisoning. <laughs> and so I, you know, I like to make sure that, that Kathy gets the credit for that, but it's in my mind, it's don't kill your clients or your prospects with jargon monoxide poisoning. You know, they, they don't understand yeah. these things that you yeah. grew up speaking and learned to speak in school. And, um, you know, the, the plain English, uh, is, is, is the antidote, I suppose, to the uh, jargon monoxide yeah, it's it's the plain English and then it's slowing down to check in a lot. Did that make sense? Do I need to explain anything? And then I think it's a couple other things. It's understanding where the buyer is in their journey and then meeting them where they are with the right kind of conversation. And what I mean by that is if it's early and they're just trying to kind of think about who do I want to work with and they're in a qualifying conversation with you, which is the first conversation you have. You're deciding, can you help? You're deciding if you should work together, that's not the time to go deep into process, for example, because that can feel overwhelming and that can inundate them with far too much information. At, at that point of the sale, they're looking to be inspired. They're looking to kind of understand a little more about your point of view, how you approach the work, that you don't need to go deep into the nitty gritty of every step that's going to happen if you engage. So it's a little bit of understanding where is that buyer and, and what's the right kind of conversation to have at that point of the sale. I love that. I, I'm going to have to read this comment that's on the screen. Well, I'm going to, mm. I'm going to, I'm going to do one before that's this one. from John. One? Oh, Okay. It's too long, I think, to, to put it up there, but it's from <laughs> Scott Thrift, who's in uh, San Francisco. He says, I have a family friend with a framed letter from Ian Fleming, thanking him for his input and being the ideal model for James so Bond. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so so there, there's your, there's your persona there. I wanted to make there sure we got that before, uh, <laughs> before we lost it. Now right. we have a comment from John Jones. Yeah. 
So we do a disc assessment. I'm reading it here. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Read and respond. Oh, I, I guess I would read. I guess. Curious if Shannon never <laughs> does a quick, for people who are only listening on the podcast. So curious if Shannon never does a quick personality assessment um, disc. Is that you say or enneagram of people she negotiates with to connect more effectively, or is that too deep in the weeds? My dad used to do that, like behind people's backs when he invited them to uh, dinner parties. <laughs> oh, oh, that's God. too good. Before he hired them somehow. <laughs> I don't know. That seemed like a lot to me when I found out about it. But anyway, so what do you do? Yeah, it's a really good question. We do disc assessments with clients um, who are, so yeah, who are going to come into coaching or training with us. But I think that's different than doing it with a potential client that would hire you for architecture. I'm getting some feedback. Is that me? Can you guys hear me okay? No, it's not you. It's not you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So it's interesting, though, to think about, like, how can you size up that client to better understand if they would be a good client? And I think it's through a series of questions around, you know, what is your desired future state? What do you want to have happen here? Um, Let's learn a little more about how you're going to decide how to hire a firm like ours. Now let's talk a bit about what's the investment you're looking to make and when do you want to get this done? So I would kind of rely on qualifying to learn more about, is that person a straight shooter? Do you trust that person? Do they have the wherewithal to, to work with you? Um, that's probably where you'd want to go with that. Uh, the, I think being able to feel that person out and, and I love the part uh, or the parts in the uh, win without pitching manifesto, the conversations, Right, that that mm-hmm. where where you're getting to uh, essentially the proposal in this conversation, uh, bef- you know, before the the one page, you know, with the signature on it, kind of idea, and um, uh, understanding how to lead a person based on their personality. I know John has another burning question because I know John pretty well. He has a, an AI tool that he likes to use, but he's thinking about uh, this other tool uh, that he uses that uh, that does that sort of assessment based on LinkedIn profiles and things like that. But I think it's super uh, okay. important for us to, yeah. to it's, none of this is one size fits all, right? That's what these conversations have to be about. Right. And you could use some form of a needs assessment, right? There could be some set of questions that you decide you want to ask that maybe don't feel like what a disc assessment would take you through, but just to get a sense of what, what would this person, you know, be like to work with. And so I could see maybe eight or 10 questions in some form of a needs assessment that might be helpful. That's a great idea. You could just have that is that questionnaire. A lot of people have questionnaires for prospective Mm -hmm. clients and they could fill out, you could sprinkle those questions in in between what's your budget and how'd you hear about me and, you know, some deeper questions about their personality. I don't feel like I do enough research on the people who are wanting to hire me. I mean, I feel like it should be a two-way situation. I mean, I Google them sometimes to see what comes up. Yeah, sometimes I do that too late. Or something. Yeah, yeah, I do that too <laughs> yeah. late sometimes, so. But... I'm, I'm- I'm right, Googling so, right now because I can never remember. I always get Dan Kennedy and, and Dan Sullivan mixed up, but but one um, of them has this, um, it's a scorecard. I forget what, what the name of it is, but this, this scorecard that they use and it's, it, you know, it's, it's about what you'd expect. Here's, here are these four or five questions and, and, you know, rank yourself between this number and this number based on your responses to these questions. And, yeah. When when I first ran across that, I thought that's fascinating, right? It's it it could be very similar to what we're talking about here as we yeah. as we're assessing uh, the needs and, and things of these clients. But what it comes down to, what's hidden in it is is attitudes, right? It's, it's the psychographics basically of of these people. And I I heard him talking about when I was studying this a little bit more, he was talking about how he designed the scorecard. And it, there was this moment of epiphany as he explained this. He's talking about, you know, what he actually built that for was to find his ideal clients. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you might go through this and score yourself between a, a 40 and a 50 or whatever the range is. And Catherine might score herself a, uh, between a, a 60 and a 70. And I might score myself between a 20 and a 30. 
Well, he has a very specific range that he's looking for, right? I'm looking yeah. for the people in this swath. Oh, okay. That's what this tool is all about. And then he turns around and he says that what we're all looking at in our ideal clients is ourselves. Mm. Uh, oh man, that's so amazing. You know, when it comes, when it comes to those attitudes and the beliefs and the, the yeah. psychographic pieces of it, we're looking to be able to align with people and find people yeah. that, that we can work with, I guess. It's that idea of we want to, and this is Simon Senek, right? We want to work with those who believe what we believe. We want to yeah. work with those who will allow us to do the best work and add the most value. And so, yeah, there needs to be some kind of like-mindedness in terms of that, I would think. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's, and I hadn't I had forgotten about you know, the start with why the aligning around why that's, mm-hmm. uh, that's another great yeah. example. Yeah. When, um, when we're, when we're trying to, or maybe, maybe when we're learning how to sell, when we're learning how, mm-hmm. um, you know, when we're, we've got a prospective client, someone raised their hand and said, Hey, I need to, I need to hire an architect. Mm-hmm. Um, in, you talked about the different personas, you talked about the baggage that we, we bring to that. Is there anything that we need to be doing before that point? You know, sometimes we talk about, if we're talking about marketing and branding, et cetera, we're talking mm-hmm. about attracting the right people. So how does all this tie in with the pre-conversation? How does it yeah. tie in with, with attracting the right people? We call that part of the sale, the probative conversation. And the probative conversation is marketing, essentially. It happens without you being present. It happens through your agents, like your thought leadership or a raving fan that refers you. And so that's a critical part of the conversation because that's where people are forming opinions about you and deciding, is this person an expert or are they a vendor in my mind? So it, it really, what informs effective marketing, what informs an effective probative conversation is your ability to demonstrate how you're different. And then your ability to consistently put content out into the world or thinking out into the world that has a point of view and a perspective um, that really then shares insights and elaborates further about your expertise in architecture for craft distilleries, for example. Um, and demonstrates that you show up at the events that matter to those types of clients or that you're out there doing podcasts or webcasts or live streams, having conversations about this type of work. And so you have to be out there. You have to be on message from the point that you're speaking through your positioning and your perspective, and you have to do it consistently, monthly. You got to do at least one thing, right? There's some numbers out there that say you need about anywhere from 2,000 to 10,000 followers on your list. Now that depends on your market, right? But also 3,000 new words of content a month that you're pushing out to really attract audiences, whether it's the written word or transcribed podcasts. And you want to have about 3,000 unique site visitors to your website a month. And again, remember, these are all like within context of your market. Some of you may have the need for lower numbers, some smaller but there has to be some scale in terms of the audience size you're talking to to have that tipping point really happen and that that phone start ringing or the email start coming in with those leads that view you as the expert. You just blew a lot of people's minds. Yeah. I know. Can, Everybody's can I, like, I hate Shannon, Shannon now. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks a lot for coming in today, Shannon. <laughs> See you later. Yeah. It's been uh, well, real. <laughs> so can you just say those numbers again just so I can write them down and put them on my monitor? Yeah, so three, so between two thousand and ten thousand followers on your list or subscribers to your your, content. Okay. Um, three thousand new words of content a month. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's two thousand, not three thousand, but two thousand unique site visitors a month. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, that's only 30 <laughs> words a day somebody said i like yeah. it see just like yeah see the, the words are no problem it's more like yeah. the unique unique visitors a month is that two thousand a month is that what you're saying a month all mm-hmm. right all right 
Well, the goals, you know, goals are good. Um, but again, I, like it depends on your your market. So there may be a need for some adjustment. This data comes um, from Newfangled, who is a content marketing firm and helps people in the business of expertise with their marketing. And it's data they've collected over time that really then proves, OK, when these numbers are hit consistently, this is when the inbound opportunities start to increase. Yeah. OK. Well, we have a couple questions about fees. Do you mind if I bring those up that sure. a, um, a listener has sent in? Okay, so um, I'm going to show this one first. So if this is a longer this is a longer question. So basically, but what she's saying is that some usually architects are um, basing their fee on a percentage of construction cost or something like that. So how do you determine mm -hmm. whether this is from um, Jane? How do we determine whether there is a gap between the value of the service? And the standard fee structure. I mean, I guess so, that's yeah. It, it, it it's going to be unique in each case. I think you have to look at each client as a unique and creative exercise in terms of developing a proposal and figuring out fees. And it really needs to begin with this idea of what is their desired future state and what do they want beyond what their need is that they're coming to you for. So let's take an easy example. Maybe it's just easy for me, but somebody's coming to you to remodel their kitchen in their home. But what they really want is a more happy home for their family. And that may require more than just a kitchen remodel. And if you can get into a conversation where you can understand their wants and then begin to work through, okay, what, what do you really want? What is really valuable to you? And think about your pricing um, from that standpoint versus just kind of the template of, oh, I know your problem. I have a solution because I see patterns all the time and your brain kind of shuts down because you go into solutions mode. If you can upend that for yourself and go in with an open mind and really understand the vision and then think about what are the solutions we can bring, you might be able to reconcile pricing a little differently and you probably will be able to help that client to be understand why the investment needs to be at the level it needs to be at if they want to achieve that desired future state. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of reversing the value chain and reversing how you sell can be something that can help. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I love that example and I love that answer. And so any of you that are out there uh, in New Jersey, just plug your ears because I'm going to talk about this in about an hour. <laughs> so, but <laughs> But it's, you know, one of the things that I like to say is if you've ever felt commoditized, if you've ever felt like they're viewing, they, the, the prospective client is viewing you as that service provider, the order taker, or whatever word we use for it, then if they come and say, hey, I, we need a kitchen remodel and you say, okay, that's why, right? They're, they're asking you for this thing. Yeah. However, if you turn that around and do exactly what you just described, you start this the conversation, the exploration of okay, what is it? What is what's the underlying motivation, right? What is it that you're really trying to get at? Well, you know, it's too small, and we're we're conflicted, you know, when we're having these having dinners and trying to fix things because there's not enough space. I just really want a happy home. Yeah. Right now, now we're getting somewhere. Now we can have this conversation. And by having that conversation, in my opinion, having that conversation and digging in and asking why, use the five whys, whatever tool you want to use. And you're starting to demonstrate the fact that you are a trusted advisor at that point or an expert or whatever term you want to use. Yeah, and I, it's, it's exactly right. And I would encourage everybody as well to think about this idea of offering options versus saying, Here's one way to do it for this fee, and that's your choice. Because when you do that, you're forcing that client to be to go shop you against others. So why not to why not offer three options where one of them might be low risk to you, but high risk to the client because it's a do-it-yourself kind of option. And then there's a high-end option that you, you're going all in. You're going to handle everything. It's the concierge service. They're not going to have to lift a finger. And then there's the middle option that's kind of a blend. Right. So because what you're trying to understand is every client values something different. And maybe there is that client that wants concierge and maybe there is that client that's OK with the do it yourself. Well, you can sell all those things. 
So it's it's a matter of thinking about options as well, I think. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to understand too that just as the client may have questions about those three options, I think it's okay for you, the architect, to also have questions. Okay, what well, you know, what what do you like and what don't you like about this option? You know, what's resonating with you here? Um, at, at the end of the day, we're just trying to get to the point of agreement, right? Trying to get to the point that what I'm what I'm going to deliver to you has the greatest impact in terms of solving your problem, reducing your pain, however we want to say that. Yep. You're so right. You're, you're in a conversation. It's a back and forth. You're trying to get to the same place where everybody's on the same page. And we forget when we get late in the sale and we go into that like pitch mode and we like put the dog and pony on and go into convince mode, but we forget we're just facilitating a choice. That's what it should be about. So it's a good point, Jeff. Oh, thanks. You got another one here, Catherine. Yep. I turned my microphone off. So if I, can you hear me now? Okay. Leslie says, can you discuss establishing expertise and demonstrating it as, um, as a thought leader? Writing, 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 what else? Well, well, you're right, Leslie, because writing is, um, it's critical. And it is, I think, the most effective way to work things out for yourself and explore things and document things, and then be able to have the written word sit on your website so you can drive people there to keep them there and get them looking at other stuff and then decide to call. Uh, it's, it's writing is invaluable, but I also recognize not everybody loves to write. So some hacks to that are, I know I do my best thinking when I'm out on a walk, carry a recording device with you and have a, a chat, right? And then maybe go back and transcribe it or work with a partner, almost like a copywriter who you can download your thoughts to and they're capturing the essence of it and you're not totally outsourcing your thought leadership and they can come back to you, you know, with something for you to react to and polish and finesse from there. Uh, I think doing podcasts and speaking are, are great ways to also, you know, work through uh, building expertise, learning expertise. Although I think a lot of times you probably do a little writing before you decide what you're going to talk about. Um, Instagram, you guys are in a visual type of, of industry, you know, you could get the word out through, in a visual nature or through videos. So there's a lot of ways to go about it. Yeah. Mm. yeah that, I think that's really important right now. I mean, just look at all the tools that are out, right? I mean, mm -hmm. You can, you can write and you can use Otter AI, which Otter, if you're out there, if you want to sponsor. <laughs> yep. um, We're it's, accepting it's sponsors. Of, yeah, exactly. That's one of, one of my favorite tools because I can, I, I could take this conversation, upload it to Otter and it will transcribe it with all three of our distinct voices as speaker one, speaker two, speaker three. That's super simple. And in, in the grand scheme of things, it costs nothing. I don't remember what the cost is, but it's so low that you could, I mean, just, just leverage the tools that are out there. Hmm, okay. Christian um, says people tend to choose the middle option, whether it's tomatoes or architectural services or Starbucks. Yeah, that's true. Sure. Yeah. So that's um, what happens in that three option proposal. Like you have that big anchor and it serves to make the middle option look like a good deal. So the middle option is the most option or often chosen. Yeah. So apparently Shannon, you are like Jeff on steroids. <laughs> that actually isn't, isn't the comment I meant to press on, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jeff, you and I are going to get in trouble if we end up in a room together someday. At, yeah. Like you know, Eccles Fest Eccles or yes, whatever it's called. Yeah. 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 Like at Ecclestock, August 13th. <laughs> Ecclestock. Yeah. <laughs> Um, John Jones wants you to come back next week and every week after that. So John Jones, how are you? I remember you from the Entree Architect talks that I did. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> maybe we maybe we could have you back every week. Every opening we have, Jeff. We'll I'm, I'm game. Later. I'm game. And I also know that because John was up there and John and I are in a mastermind group together as well. So sorry to spill the beans, John, if this is overstepping, I apologize. But I know that he has implemented a lot of uh, when without pitching in his work, he's got a, a, 
a yeah. uh, three tiered proposal, et cetera. So he's, he's really put a lot of those things in action. That's great. And congratulations. Good for you. Well, he, do we have- he works across the street from a Starbucks too. Ugh, well, who doesn't, Jeff? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fair. <laughs> um, do we have time for another question? Have you got time, Shannon? Yeah. All right. I do. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So as a follow-up kind of to the first question um, about the value, how do you determine the value? She was talking about the, uh, what's your suggestion on determining the value of our service for exchange of the shares? She's thinking of going into a development mm. relationship. <clears throat> so yeah. how, I mean, it would be similar. I would guess that you have to get them to see your value. Yeah. And I love that you're thinking outside of the box here with this question and this opportunity, because there's no one pricing strategy that you should just like go all in on. You should be really open to different pricing strategies and this idea of getting equity, um, pay for performance, like think about it all. So how do you determine the value? You know, I guess, I guess there is that one to one dollar exchange you could think about, like what is the typical monetary value and just go from there. But I also think it's important to be able to have a value conversation. That's the other like really important skill in business because by having a value conversation, you learn about that desired future state I was talking about earlier. You start to understand what are we gonna measure that is most important to you, Miss Client? How are we gonna know if we're successful? What's the metric we're gonna attach to it? And then how might we assign value based on that? And so you may learn that you know, in a new development that's happening that they want to hit 80% capacity by next July. If you somehow contribute to that and they hit that number and it's an X increase in profit, well, what share of that profit is fair to share with you? So you have to get into a little bit more of a sophisticated conversation, the value conversation to unearth some of this stuff. But if you can learn that and master that, that will probably get you pretty far in figuring out what, what might this be worth. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a great uh, recommendation. And as someone that has been in this situation before and had it work out extremely well for us, um, I, I I think that's all great advice. And I also, you know, it can be it can be really hard, especially if you're working with developers. No offense, developers out yeah. there, but it can be really hard to to push that. But make sure you're not selling yourself short. Um, an an example, we, we, we did that. We, uh, firm that I was with a long time ago now, I guess, uh, we did that and set, did all of those things that you just said, set the metrics, et cetera. And, 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 um, the only problem was that I don't think the developer believed that we were going to be Mm -hmm. able to hit the numbers. And so when we did hit the numbers, we, you know, we did perform and all, all those things, right? All the boxes were checked. Everything went as well as it possibly could, even though the developer made more money than they expected to make. They had to pay us more than they expected to pay us. And they never wanted to enter into an agreement like that again. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, it was a one-off with that particular one, but make sure that you make sure you're not selling yourself short on that. Yeah. And you do, you're right about this idea of all the stars aligned, but then maybe there is this gut check that has to happen. Like, do we trust them? Or or is this going to be something we can enter into in good faith? And sometimes that's a hard hard call to make. So there's Mm -hmm. risk in in this idea of value pricing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And you know, what's, what's the old, the business axiom that you get, uh, you get compensated for, for the amount of risk that you take on or something like that. Mm-hmm. I forget exactly That's how right. it goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Carly's uh, comment is interesting there about she scrapped the middle option. So the small option is simply to a lead into the big one. There you go. And mm. she's a believer in not offering something you don't want to deliver. <laughs> I, I would totally agree. Oh with yeah. That. Totally. Yeah. I don't, don't put anything out there. You don't want to deliver. So that's interesting. So just two options. One is small, one is large, but the goal is to get them to buy the large. Am I understanding that right, Carly? So I I do, um, I do one, the small one is the minimum that I'm willing to do. 
and the, mm-hmm. the medium one is is the one that I usually do. And then the large one is a ridiculously large one, you know, that is like every single thing is taken care of. Like you said, the concierge service, which no one ever does. So, but. So here's what I'll say about that. This idea of pricing, offering options, value pricing, it should all be in service of creating the most value for your client as possible. So it's not it's not really about you. And I don't mean to be flip about that. What I mean is like you really should enter into these things thinking that way. What is the the most value I can add and what are the best options I can put forth um, without any shenanigans behind the scenes, right? Like offering options isn't um, shenanigans or trying to trick somebody. It's about offering options. And sure, the anchor does serve to make the middle option look like a good deal, but you should be prepared to be able to deliver on that anchor if they choose it. So it's a little bit of a a shift in like, it's kind of more about the client and what we can do for them and the value we can create. And then the delightful consequence, as Blair says, is that everybody profits on a different level Mm -hmm. if you go in with that mindset. And I think, you know, I'm glad you said that. And it's the first time that we've really said it in exactly that way. But a lot of these questions and a lot of that converse or a lot of the conversation that we've been having, uh, in, in fact, a lot of the the book as well, is another another sort of mindset shift. It is all about them, right? When when yeah. an architect needs to explain what the client gets when the client hires them, mm-hmm. the client the client's not looking for your process. They're not looking for a list of your services. They're, they're literally saying, what do I get when I hire you? Right. If I wanted you to, to explain your process to me, I'd say, what's your process? So I think that mindset of, of it's about the client and not about us. I think that's, that's really fundamental here. Yeah. Well, it's five Oh four. Just to remind you, yeah, in case I know we're having a fun time and everything, but it's my job. We could, to we could, uh, remind we could keep you. this up for a while, but we're going to have Shannon back every week from now on. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'll so we'll come back. <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. Well, Shannon, we really appreciate you being here and uh, all the work that you're doing at at uh, Win Without Pitching. And um, uh, a little bird told me that Blair is working on something new now as well. So uh, we're looking forward to finding out what that is. Uh, yes. For uh, those of you that are on Clubhouse, and I haven't, I've had to sort of put blinders on a little bit lately, so I haven't paid as much ten- attention to what's going on on Clubhouse, but Blair and Chris Doe have been having some incredible sessions on Clubhouse. Um for any of you out there uh, that are interested in on that platform, you might look for those. But, um, but Shannon, this is this has been a great conversation. You've shed a lot of light on uh, on winning work for these architecture firms that are out there. Uh, so, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for everything you shared today. Yeah, thank you. It was great to be here. I really always love being with all of you. You have a great group, and just good luck, everybody out there. Have fun doing what you're doing. Great. Thank you. Uh, And for those of you that are listening on the uh, podcast episode, if you want to uh, find out more about Shannon and about Win Without Pitching and all the things that are available, there's there's books and there's resources and coaching and training, all sorts of things. Just go to winwithoutpitching.com, smash all those words together like it's one thing. And winwithoutpitching.com is a place to find uh, all of that information. Of course, you can buy uh, the one without pitching manifesto, wherever you buy uh, books, I think you have to order um, price and creativity. Do you have to order price and creativity yeah. through the website? Mm-hmm. Through the so, website, yep, that's right. Yeah, so um, that that's another one. That's that's next level, right? That's maybe that's our next conversation. Yeah. But uh, you can yeah. order price and creativity through the website. Of course, Shannon mentioned the two Bobs podcast, and someone on. Uh, on uh, Clubhouse this morning, asked about the two Bobs reference. Just go watch Office Space. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go, go watch. It's it. worth Office watching Space. it again. <laughs> yeah, it, it absolutely is. There's even a red stapler on, on the, well, totally. the yeah, artwork. I, so, 
Yeah. Yep. So check that out. Those are all ways that you can find uh, more about Win Without Pitching. And you can connect with Shannon on LinkedIn as well. It's S H A N N Y N Lee, L E E. So Shannon yep. Lee is on uh, LinkedIn. Connect with her there. Um, for the Context and Clarity crew, we will be back on Clubhouse tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. Of course, uh, Catherine is going to host that tomorrow. I'm not sure if I'm going to be back. We've got uh, an appointment to go to. I'm not sure if I'll be back in time to host it. So Catherine is going to take that over tomorrow. It's going to be an introduce yourself uh, episode of uh, our coffee talks tomorrow. And then at 4 p.m. Eastern back inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group, we're going to uh, continue with our tradition of highlighting and celebrating one of our uh, community members tomorrow. So we'll have a member spotlight. I can't tell you who it's going to be. Everybody yeah. requested. I mean, and I do mean yeah. literally everybody requested <laughs> that it be a surprise or at least several people. <laughs> the thing is, I know um, you already told me who it was and now I can't remember, <laughs> but I'll find out tomorrow. And, and with that, you can tell how much uh, Catherine looks at the spreadsheet, the planning spreadsheet. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we yeah. will have a, a surprise member spotlight tomorrow. So join us for that. It's going to be another good time, loose and lively conversation with one of our community members. You'll see them on screen. You'll hear their voice and uh, we'll get to, uh, we'll get to know one of our friends just a little bit better. So join us for that. And of course, next week at, on Thursday, uh, 4 PM Eastern for uh, context and clarity live, we'll have a new special guest and our guest next week. We'll get us, we're sticking with this marketing theme for a little bit here. Uh, Mark W. Schaefer will be our guest. He is an author. He's an educator. He's a marketing thought leader. Um, I've been following Mark for a long time. Um, I, I love everything he writes. And so uh, I'm going to have a good time <laughs> talking to Mark. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm going to have a good time next week <laughs> talking to Mark Schaefer. So join us for that. And again, thanks for joining us today. We always appreciate all of you for all of your comments, for all of the time you spend with us here on Context and Clarity. Uh, thank you. You have made this a thing. Without you, we would not have been here having this conversation with Shannon Lee today. So thanks for making Context and Clarity a thing. So be well, stay safe, keep yourself well, um, and keep those around you well and safe. And uh, take a little bit of time to breathe tonight, rejuvenate, and come back tomorrow because we're going to do this all over again. So thanks everybody. Have a great evening or a great morning wherever you are in the world. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody.